Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. I'm Kevin Grosso, your host for this episode, and I'm very excited to talk with Paul Nation today about second language acquisition theory and practice. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Paul Nation is Emeritus Professor in Applied Linguistics at the School of Linguistics and Applied Language Studies at Victoria, Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. His specialist, his specialist interests are the teaching and learning of vocabulary and language teaching methodology. He has taught in Indonesia, Thailand, the United States, Finland, and Japan. His resources, publications, word lists, graded readers, free books, language teaching videos, vocabulary tests, vocabulary analysis programs, vocabulary bi- bibliography can be found at a link we'll post in the show notes. These include a free book called What Do You Need to Know to Learn a Foreign Language? And most of his articles are free to download. So I'd like to just start off this interview um, just picking your brain about some higher level questions. Obviously, you've been in the field for, for a very long time um, and you know you're, you have a lot of knowledge behind you just doing research for for decades so um what what does it mean when when people talk about knowing or acquiring a language what are we even um you know what is the field of second language acquisition in that sense what are we trying to uh, accomplish i guess it's use of the language is the main goal and People do have various uses, but and often the uses uses are for communicating with other people. I, I think in the case of the the type of language study that uh, you folks are doing, it's really it's it's language use, but language use from the point of view of reading and getting receptive knowledge. But I think it has to be language in use, and I think accompanying that there has to be the idea of fluency as well, because you have to be able to reach a reasonable degree of fluency in what you do. In normal language learning, the idea is that you you should try to be fluent with whatever bits of the language that you know. So, for example, we developed a survival vocabulary for foreign travel, which consists of about 120 words and phrases. Well, people people can learn those in just a few hours, but they need, also need to become very fluent in their use so that they can use them in a communicative situation. So really, it's knowing a language is being able to use it and being able to use it with a certain degree of fluency. It doesn't have to mean knowing the whole language or being really high proficiency, but I think it should involve some, some idea of use and some idea of fluency with what is already known. Yeah, that's that's really helpful, and I think a, a really important distinction that you can you can learn something on on one occasion, but not be able to use it on the next occasion because you you don't have it is not fluent, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a know. sort of I have a sort of story about that. It's um, when I, one of the first times I went to Japan, I was on a train with my wife, and we're going to another city, and I wasn't quite sure if we we're on the right train or not. And anyway, I saw a young lady, a very studious looking young lady with glasses and that and sitting in the row next to us. So I, I turned to her and said very slowly in English, you know, is this the train to Osaka? And she buried her face in her hands, went, oh, like, and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? But anyway, someone up the front said, yes, Osaka. And anyway, so the train goes along, and then she's sitting in the same row as us, but across the aisle, and she pulls out a book and starts reading. And I accidentally dropped my pencil on the floor, bent down, had a look and see, looked up to see what was the title of the book. And the book was called The Macroeconomics of Agriculture. And so here's a, here's a learner of English who's reading a book without seemingly without the use of a dictionary called the macroeconomics of agriculture. I don't think I could read a book called the macroeconomics of agriculture. And anyway, but she then she can't deal with that, that spoken use of the language. We get off the train in Osaka and she comes up and she says, where are you going? 
And now I guarantee she's been practicing that sentence in her head for the last 15 minutes, you know. But in, in we gradually managed to have a conversation and, and that sort of thing. And it turns out that she's a master's level student studying the macro economics of agriculture and so on. But it's quite a good example of how you can actually know a language in one way. And that I'm sure she had a very large vocabulary and a really good knowledge of grammar and could read quite well. But... but to be able to use it for speaking was really something that was a real challenge to her as far as she was concerned. Now, maybe she doesn't need it for speaking anyway. Maybe she just needs it to read about the macroeconomics of agriculture, you know, and that's fine. Well, and, and that's a really interesting example of, of actually building fluency right in one area. I mean, she seemed to be a fluent reader if she could read that yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to touch on, so I, we're going to talk a lot more about fluency um, in a few minutes, but I wanted to touch on on something, um, you know, a question that we often get, which is language immersion in the classroom. Mm. Um, so should only the second language be used in the classroom? And is that the most effective way to, to learn the language? Well, uh... I have a, an opinion on this, and not all agree with it, but I'll go with my opinion. And I, I think that you should use the first language in the classroom. I know the arguments against it, and the arguments against it are things like, you know, people will think in the first language instead of the second language, and you're taking time away from hearing the first language. And, and, and you know, there's certain, certain things in these arguments. But it's just that from a vocabulary perspective, it's much easier to explain the meanings of words and to deal with the meanings of words using first language translations than it is to try and struggle through second language definitions and so on of these words. Um, and so from a vocab perspective, I think it, it's, it's really time-saving and very efficient and effective to use the first language as a way of conveying word meaning. Um, having said that, I would also want to make sure that um, the first language use, uh, like running the classroom and things like that, I think that should be done in the second language where you have opportunities for repetition to occur and the opportunities for a you know a limited set of things to be really learnt well. I think it's, it's good to use that opportunity and do it in the second language. But I, I think as a, as, a, as a blanket rule, I wouldn't agree with that rule of excluding the first language. Research on vocabulary knowledge shows that at low levels of proficiency, and probably even low intermediate levels of proficiency, the first language and the second language share the same lexical store. So even if you don't translate words, they will be stored with their first language translations anyway. So you're not, you're not really avoiding a first language connection just by avoiding use of the first language. The brain will connect these things in spite of what you want. So, so, so then that the idea that, you know, you, you're, I, I mean, I, part of the arguments that I've heard is, okay, we don't want them to start thinking in, you know, like English categories, for example, when I'm learning another language, um, you're saying just our brains are going to do that anyway, and there's no no way of getting around it, at least for the beginning. Yeah, and th then there's this idea, you had immersion in the question. Yeah. And if, if we take the sort of technical, semi-technical meaning of immersion, that means simply with the language all around you and you're just using the language. The danger of immersion as a way of learning a language is that it often excludes deliberate attention to language features. And I think a language course has to include deliberate attention to language features, such as learning vocabulary, getting improvements and, you know, focused improvements in pronunciation, learning some important points of grammar and things. These are important parts of vocabulary learning. And deliberate attention to language speeds up language learning. Hmm. It's the trouble in many classrooms is that this attention to language dominates the whole classroom. And this idea of the four strands that I've worked with for quite a few years now really tries to put this in perspective by saying 
about a quarter of the time in a course should be spent learning the language, learning about the language, learning strategies for learning the language and things in you know, studying the principles of language learning. And three quarters of the time should be spent using the language. So, so l let's let's touch on the, those four strands. So, what are these? I mean, this is something you're known for in the field. Um, can you tell us, yeah, what they are and, and why they're important? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I've been teaching, training teachers of English and teaching English for over fifty years, and at one point I reached the stage where I said I've read a hell of a lot of the research. I sort of understand the research, but I don't see really see how it fits together all into one sort of program. And so then for about a year or so, I sort of just kept thinking about, you know, how does this piece of research relate to this and how do we bring them together and so on. And eventually it occurred to me that the, there should be four kinds of opportunities for learning within a language classroom. And, and these are all fairly obvious. The first kind of opportunity for learning is learning through input, and that is learning through listening and learning through reading. So people should be using the language in the classroom at the level which is the right level for them, and this is very important. You know, using, getting listening input and reading input which is at the right level, and then and then using that as a way of of um, developing skill in the language but also incidentally learning language features. The second major opportunity for learning is learning through output and that's learning through speaking and through writing. And people should have the opportunity to make use of the language in the, these productive ways. The third kind of learning is deliberate learning and deliberate study of the language. I call it language focused learning. There are other names for it, such as form-focused instruction and so on, but I don't like those names for various reasons. But it just simply means deliberately learning vocabulary. I, I'm a fan of rote learning using word cards or flashcard programs to remember the uh, a word and its first language translation and so on. And there's all sorts of things. And I also think that a really important part of a language course is also learning how to learn. I remember struggling away when I was in Indonesia, struggling away to learn Indonesian and to learn Javanese, the local language where where I was living. And I, I, and I had a teacher at one point, you know, a one-to-one -one teacher, but I didn't know what to do with the teacher. You know, how do I make the best use of the teacher? And there are now well-established principles of language learning that language learners should know about. For example, the importance of repetition, uh, the importance of spacing the repetitions, the importance of processing things deeply and thoughtfully so that they stick in memory and so on. And so that book you mentioned at the beginning, it's a free book, incidentally, on my website called What Do You Need to Know to Learn a Foreign Language? I tried to write down in that what the major principles are and how you apply these principles. And these principles actually apply to things way beyond language learning. If you want to learn anything, you know, even driving a car or things like that, the, the principles of learning are roughly similar for all of those. So I think that part of the language-focused learning strand is not only giving deliberate attention to language, but also becoming an independent language learner in that you know how to go about learning. Hmm. I've got a... There's an interesting story about that too, actually. Um, I I uh, was working outside and I fell over and I hurt my shoulder. And uh, so I went to a physiotherapist to get it fixed, you know, to get some treatment and so on. And it turned out that the physiotherapist was a very good friend of my nephew. They'd worked together as post office technicians. And as technicians doing post office telecom type of work, uh, they had to do various little courses and things like that. And in one of the courses that they did, one of the instructors said, look, here's things you've got to learn. Now, here's how to go about learning these things. And he gave them some advice. 
It actually wasn't terribly good advice, but it, but it was better than no advice. It was things like write it on post-it notes and stick it on, you know, in front of the toilet. So when you go to the toilet, you'll see these things and stick them on the refrigerator and so on like that. You know, it wasn't very sophisticated or well-based advice, but it was it was showing them how to learn. And so this guy started doing these things and he thought, gee, when I was at secondary school, I thought I was dumb. I thought I wasn't really good at anything. And now that this guy showed me what to do, I realized that I can actually learn quite well. And so when he became redundant from telecom, he went and did a course in physiotherapy. Did really well and is now a very well-known physiotherapist. Mm. And that really goes back to his teacher showing him not only what to learn, but showing him how to learn as well. And so that's a really important part of the language-focused learning strand. The fourth strand in the four strands is fluency development. And fluency development needs to be skill-focused. You need to have reading fluency development, listening fluency development, speaking and writing fluency development. And by focusing on fluency, by working with really easy material and getting really fast at using what you already know, you then free up a lot of space to focus on the, on the things that are new for you to learn and so on. And fluency development activities are very effective. You know, just working over and over, repeating things and, and, and reading really easy material or talking about things you know a lot about, you develop fluency quite rapidly but it needs to have a focus. And so in any language course, I think that the time over the period of a month or so should be equally divided between those four strands. 25% for learning from input, 25% from output, 25% from deliberate language-focused learning, and about 25% on fluency development. And that way, about three quarters of the time, the input, output, and fluency, is focused on language use. And about one quarter of the time, the language focused learning, is focused on features of the language itself. And I think that's quite a good balance. So, so yeah, this, this is really helpful. So I, I wanna maybe touch on this fluency piece again, because I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people use the word fluency. Um, mm. oh, and it yeah. seems like what they mean is, you know, can you can you hold a conversation with a native speaker in a way yeah. that you know doesn't uh, you know doesn't yeah. cause them to scratch their head and wonder what you're saying, right? Um, so so what does this mean to be you know fluent in writing, for example, and and how how do we so 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 I, I think that like having the conversation is more of the like you know meaning focused uh, or communicative exchange, right? Meaning focused output, yeah. saying something and, and, and being input. able to hear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it, how are these fluency drills different? Well, f I'm using fluency in a very limited sense, and the fluency simply is measured in something like words per minute or something like that. So, if you're measuring speaking fluency, you would expect someone to speak at a speed of round of roughly 150 to 200 words per minute. And if you're looking at reading fluency, the upper limit of reading fluency, certainly in English, is around about 300 words per minute. If someone is reading faster than 300 words per minute, then they're jumping a lot of the material which is there through previous knowledge or something like that. But there are, there are speeds which are the normal sorts of speeds which native speakers would work at. And so by my use of the fluency, I simply mean being able to use what you know at a speed which is about the same as that of what a native speaker would do. Now, you could say, for example, well, I'm fluent in Thai uh, because I can use the Thai survival vocabulary of about 120 items very fluently indeed. <laughs> And I'm also fluent in Japanese with the 120 items. I, I remember meeting a, a Japanese friend of a relative of mine uh, a few months ago, you know, uh, and I, I sort of greeted him and told him who I was and said, please look on me favorably, all in Japanese. And he was highly impressed, you know. Wow, this guy's fluent in Japanese. Well, I was, but I'm only fluent in the 120 words and phrases. <laughs> but the point here is that at any level of proficiency, 
it's all, it's important that fluency is a part of that. It's not left to the some goal in the future. It's actually happening all along the way. The things that you're learning very soon become fluent, and that has to be a learning and teaching goal. So would you say then, I mean, that some some classrooms go like too fast in some sense in, the, in that they, they don't repeat old material enough to get fluent at that material? I would say that lack of repetition is a major problem in, in language teaching. Uh, I've been sort of thinking about this over the last year or two. My sort of rough rule of thumb at the moment, which I can't completely justify, but I'm working on it, is that in any taught language course, about a third of the time should be spent going back to material in previous lessons. Mm. And the, re the reason is simple. And the, the reason is simple is that in certainly vocabulary learning, and I think in more general language learning, there are two things that matter. One thing is repetition. You can't learn without repetition. And the second thing that matters is quality of mental processing at the moment that you are learning. And if your quality of mental processing is deep and thoughtful, then it's more likely to stick in your memory. And so repetition and quality of processing are really important for the learning of vocabulary. If you think that by introducing something in the lesson, you say, good, I've dealt with that, what's the next thing? You, you're fooling yourself because you're only on one step towards actually learning what was presented in that lesson. And you can also argue that the new material in any lesson is actually the least important part of a lesson. It's like if you buy something but you don't have enough money to pay for it all and you pay it off payment by payment. You know, which payment is the most important? Is it the first payment or is it the payment which is near the end, which takes you over the, the thing of now I own it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think sort of logically you'd have to say it's the later, it's the later repetitions or payments that are really important because they're getting you to the point where now this becomes part of your knowledge and you don't have to worry about losing it anymore. Right. Right. So, so really it's like, you know, you, you have the, the new material in the lesson and if you have repetition, you know, in the program, right, then you're just banking on them seeing it again and, you know, again and again and again. And eventually, you know, on the 10th time, they're going to remember it. And, and that's when, that's what you're really after anyway. Is that, is that yeah, kind of that's what right. And, and you can go back to old lessons in two major ways. One way is simply go back to the old lesson and do exactly the same thing again. And maybe try and do it a bit faster and develop a bit of fluency maybe. And then the other way is to go back to the old lesson and do it a little bit differently. Mm. You know, if you if you uh, did it as an individual activity, go back and do it as a pair activity or vice versa. Um, if it if it was a spoken activity, go back and do it as a writing activity or something like that. You know, make some minor change so that the quality of processing is deepened through the through the change, and so that the because we know that when repetition is varied, it's much more effective than when repetition is exactly the same as you've done before. Now, both kinds of repetition are good, but the strongest one is varied repetition. Yeah, and so teachers should really have the skill of saying, yeah, well, let's, let's do the new bit in this lesson fairly quickly and, and try and process it deeply, and then we're going to go back and look at what we've done before because that's keeping that moving towards being known yeah yeah so that's that's also really helpful so i i want to ask another question about this fluency um just to try to get at um you know kind of what it is and and how it differs from um specifically language focused learning with like flashcards for example so you know if, if we define fluency as knowing well you know um the material that that you've learned right something like that then w why wouldn't something like you know space repetition with flashcards be considered fluency since it's going back over you know material that that you've learned and, and trying to get it to stick in your head well i i wouldn't call repetition with flashcards 
a major way of developing fluency. I think fluency has to be developed within a language skill such as listening, speaking, reading, writing. Having said that, uh, I would also say that you can develop a type of fluency with flashcards, and that's fluency of quickly recalling the meaning. Hmm. I remember when when I lived in Japan for a while, going into the post office to post a letter home to our son in New Zealand. And I'd put the letter across the counter, and the guy would weigh it, and he'd say, Hachi ni juen. And I'd sort of go, ah, yeah, yeah. And he'd look at me, and he'd get his calculator, type 120 onto it, and show it to me, you see, so I could read the number. And then I thought about it, you know, after a few times of doing it, I thought, this is stupid, because I know all the numbers. You say, what's the number for 100? I can tell you. What's the number for 20? I can tell you. But going into this post office, and he says it, I, you know, can't do it. So I sat down with the teacher, and we wrote down all the numbers from 1 to 10, and the teacher would say the number, and I'd point to the number, you know, hutch, knee, ju, so on, and like that. And, and I could do the first 10 quite quickly, and we'd come back, and the next lesson we'd do it again, and go on like that, developing a kind of fluency. And then, of course, because you, you 10, 10 yen doesn't buy you anything in Japan, we had to go into the hundreds and do that, and, and you make a little matrix, and they say the number, and then you point, and after about five or six sessions of this, I got really fluent, and I can remember the day I went into the post office, threw my letter across the counter, the guy says, Hutch, see you in, and I put out exactly the right change on the counter, and walked out feeling very proud of myself. Probably tripped over on the way out, knowing me, you know, <laughs> your greatest prides, your greatest failures. But, but that's that's for things like numbers and that you can develop a good fluency, and you need to develop a good fluency quite early on. But in general, fluency has to be related to some use of the language. Right. Right. Okay. So that that's that's helpful. So I I, I want to now pair. Um, the language skills with with the strands. So, um, you know, I, I think you mentioned this earlier, but that uh, well, well, maybe you can just spell it out for us again, so that so that we get it straight. So, how how are these? You know, the four language skills that people normally talk about are reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So, how are they related yeah. to to the four strands? Yeah. Okay. Well, the the input strand involves listening and reading. So the meaning-focused input. And uh, and I understand that for your learners, your input is fairly well defined, I guess. You've, you, you know, you've got, you've got the intention of reading biblical literature, is that right? And, and, and there's not much you can do about that uh, in that sense. Um, in English, we learners of English are really lucky because in, in English there are several thousand graded readers which means you can buy books which are written within 100 words of English. So if you know 100 words of English, the right 100 words, there's about half a dozen books that you can immediately go and read. And if you know 200 words or 250 words of English, there's probably about you know, 100, 200 books you can go and read. And, 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 and most of the vocabulary in the books will be within your knowledge. And this goes on right up, well, it actually goes up right on now till about the 8,000 the, uh, you know, 8, words. Hmm. Now, in the case of your folks, it's, it's pretty difficult because, you know, I don't see it would be that acceptable to present simplified versions of biblical literature, which you gradually worked your way through. I mean, that's a bit actually this is something that's being done for sure. Is it? Oh, yeah. I just wondered if there was sort of religious objections to it. You know. Well, you know, you have to learn the language somehow. So, <laughs> so yeah, people yeah. are starting to do this, right? And and not just simplified, but also just you know short story, just you know using the same language structures and you know short stories and things like that. Um, yeah. We're getting a little bit distracted from the question, but there's yeah, an important yeah. point here. And the important point is that languages, language use uh, can be, if we, if we take an example of language use and turn it into a frequency list. So say we take a book, which is, you know, communicating a message and everything like that. And then we do an analysis of that using a computer program, which turns it into a frequency list of the words in the book. Half of the words in the book will only occur once. Hmm. That's Zipf's law. 
and it, it, that's it, it and and it seems that most languages follow zip's law all the languages that i've had contact with certainly do anyway and it's a problem for learning because it means that when you work through a text about half of the different words you meet are going to only occur once and you won't see them again properly now when you when you're in your situation where you have a very limited number of texts i guess um you know i'm sure that half of the words are one timers and yeah. and that you know you've just got to learn them and that's that and then then they're only going to be use you know in that particular occasion and that particular context and so on like that um so that's quite tricky with for that but anyway so the the language use uh, with the four skills so we have input which is listening and speaking and in in ordinary language courses we would have a extensive listening program and an extensive reading program where the learners do lots of reading and they do lots of listening much more listening and reading than you could fit into a course book for example mm. um the recommendation is that for an extensive reading program learners should be reading at least one or two graded readers a week uh every every week of the school year and so they should be reading you know in their first year of learning english they should be reading close to even half a million running words per year a lot you know yeah, well. now most most schools don't do that but they should be doing it hmm. now the output strand covers the skills of speaking and writing and so speaking covers a range of speaking activities such as talking with others in informal ways giving formal monologue talks all the ranges of speaking that we would normally have to do and then you also have writing in the output strand now in the fluency strand you would have separate fluency programs for each one of the four skills and so if you want to get really sort of arithmetical about it you know 1/16th of the course time should be spent on reading fluency and 1/16th of the course time you know that's one quarter of one strand you know should be of the fluency strand should be spent on writing fluency and and so on like that now in language focused learning there's also some deliberate learning which relates to particular skills um but vocabulary learning applies across the range of skills but you also would need to do productive vocabulary learning that is looking at the translation and trying to recall the foreign word so that you had the knowledge which was necessary for speaking and writing so the the four skills fit quite easily into the four strands and and are quite clearly in there Hey, this is Nick with Biblingo, and I hope you're enjoying this podcast series on biblical language pedagogy. If you're a teacher, faculty, or a student that would like to see these pedagogical principles implemented at your institution, then we have a special event for you. On May 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we're hosting a webinar called How to Enhance Your Biblical Language Program with Biblingo. We'll show you how you can leverage these proven language learning methods in your biblical language program using the Biblingo software and our supplemental resources. Click the link in the description or go to biblingo.org slash webinar to register for the event. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, in in um, in this world, you know, in biblical language pedagogy, I think there there are people that are taking second language acquisition methods and applying them, right? Beginning to apply them to to the biblical languages. And because part of that is active recall you know that's that's obviously being being applied as well and people have have seen good results from that in reading but but i think what what's interesting is that I, i'm not sure how much people have done um you know extensive reading like you're talking about right of of really reading one to two books per week you know at your level when you just know 100 vocabulary words right because that material doesn't exist um yeah. The, the the way you could sort of try and get around it i guess is that that another way of developing sort of fluency is by by going back and doing the same material again mm. and going back and doing it again i mean i'm trying to learn how to read thai at the moment 
and I, I started with the school books that young children use because they're, they're actually very, the old ones in Thai are very well written indeed. They're, they're full of daily events and and uh, things that you, you know, it's very useful vocabulary indeed, going to the market and, you know, going going to school and all of this sort of stuff. And um, and I'm I'm probably reading them for about the fifth time now, and starting to get quite fluent at doing it. Now, one way would be to to say divide up your text into lots of segments. I mean, it's it's no big deal to do that, and then simply to say, okay, we study this segment, and then we're going to go back and we're going to look through it again and read it again carefully. Then we'll move to segment number two, and then. We'll also go back and look at segment number one again, you know, and you mm-hmm. and you have this increasing sort of move on to a new segment, study that carefully, and then go back and do the old ones again. And so that by the time you get to the end of part of your program, they might have read the the text in segment one, you know, 15, 20 times. And, mm. and you can make it sort of more interesting and challenging by, by saying keep a record of your speed each time or here are some other questions you might think to answer on later repetitions and so on. So that, that's one way. And you could simply then use repeated attention to the same material as a sort of substitute for extensive reading. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. So um, and, and there actually are graded readers that are that are built that way. Um, just taking one text and giving vocabulary. Um, I mean, I think one one thing that you mentioned in your book that I think some people might find surprising is that you should comprehend 98% of the words in a text for it to be on your level for, for extensive reading. Um, yeah, well, so, it's not. It's it's just common sense. And, and the way to work, there is research to support it. But the reason why it's just common sense is that 98% means two out of every hundred are unknown. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's one word in every 50 is unknown. Now, if there are 300 words on a page, that's six words per page unknown. Now, you can manage that, you know. But say you had 90% coverage where one out of every 10 words was unknown. One word in every line was an unknown word. You know, how much success and and sort of, you know, ease of reading are you going to get from that, where in every single line is an unknown word, you know. So if you just simply do it like that and say, well, you know, what's 95% coverage? Well, 95% is 1 in 20. If there are 10 words in a line, it's one unknown word in every two lines. You know, how, how would you tolerate that? You know, even that's too heavy. And so with 98, we're saying one word in every five lines is unknown. And that's yeah. sort of about, which sort of makes sense. But it also matches up with the research and that the greater coverage of text you've got, the easier it's going to be for you to read the text, which is also a pretty common sense finding, you know. Right, right. But it, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, most people, when they're when they're learning Greek or Hebrew to, to read, they they never get to 98 <laughs> percent. So so it, it really is one of those things where people, you know, will will read a line and there will be two words on the line that they that they don't understand. And so it's very, very slow. Um, but but I think that this goes back to your point that, you know, it's really necessary to to start out with text, you know, as, or, or to try to create the situation where we have texts that are easy enough for us to read more fluently, right? Yeah, that's right. And and you see your example of two unknown words per line. One of those words will only occur once in the whole text. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and so any effort spent on learning it is not going to repay be repaid by the by the chance of meeting it again and therefore you know having a chance to either to learn it or or to deal with it because it's already known you know yeah yeah so it's sure. a challenge so, yeah yeah and mm. to be fair you know most people that are interested in these languages you know, are are interested in the wider literature as well. So you know, you're mm. you're reading different Koine texts or um, you know the Dead Sea Scrolls in in ancient Hebrew or something like that. Um, but but I I just want to like go talk about this sort of like extensive reading versus intensive reading because 
you know, this is something you and you mentioned in your book again. Um, so that intensive reading is is the grammar translation method, or or it's sometimes called that. Um, you know, where it's you, a version of it. Yeah. Right. Right. So where you look at a text, um, you know, very carefully. Well, well, you tell me. So, so what is intensive reading, um, and then what are the benefits and drawbacks of this this method? Well, intensive reading fits into the language focused learning strand, where you give deliberate attention to language. So, intensive reading, in a way, I I don't classify as meaning focused input. It's not it's not normal reading, but it's reading where you give deliberate attention to the language features of the text. Now, you can give this deliberate attention by using the first language if you want to, and then it would be grammar translation. I think that you can do intensive reading through the second language, because if you had an intensive reading as a, as a common enough activity, then the type, type of language you would use to explain some language features and to talk about could be repeated and repeated and therefore help the learning of the course. So it would always be good to see how much of intensive reading you could use, you could do using the second language. But I certainly wouldn't exclude the first language from it because it's a good way of getting a point across where people fully understand what you mean, you know. Um, and so it, intensive reading can focus on the pronunciation of words in the text. It can focus on spelling patterns. Uh, it can focus on morphological features, prefixes and suffixes and stems and things like that. It can focus on unknown vocabulary. It can focus on word groups. It can focus on grammatical features. It can focus on the discourse, the way the text is organized and, and the way sentences are linked to each other. You can focus simply on comprehension. But uh, comprehension, is, for me, is not so important in extensive reading as a focus because one of, the, one of the guidelines you can apply to intensive reading is how will today's work make tomorrow's reading easier? Mm. And that's, So when doing intensive reading, the teacher shouldn't be saying, how can I make today's text clear to the learner? That seems to me a little bit misfocused. It should be, how can I do deal with today's text so that tomorrow's text is easier for the learner? And then that way you are dealing with things which are a bit more generalizable and, and a bit more useful. So, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a really interesting point. I mean, really, that you should be focusing on on the language rather than that specific text, <laughs> right? Exactly. In a way, the specific text is almost like a distraction, you know. Right, Because you, right. you think that the topic vocabulary of that text is really important. But in a language course, next week will be a different topic and that vocab won't occur again. And so the right. vocab which will occur again is a really important thing to focus on. So, so just if we if we go back to the four strands and applying, you know, this. So, so you said that that intensive reading is not um, meaning focused input, and but it's part of language focused learning. So, right. even if we were to have a course of just reading, right, yeah. then we would we would have meaning focused reading. We would have fluency reading, right, right. and then we would have language focused learning of which. Of, of which you know let's we even if we said half of that half of that is intensive reading and half of that is you know let's say flashcards right yeah, um, flashcards and strategies and how right, to go so, about learning yeah. so even like a you know a quarter of that then then we're getting down to you know let's say a 12th you know or a, or a 10th of of the actual time should be spent in intensive reading yeah, well, you you, you can get you, you can get that even more precisely because if, if we if we say meaning focus input and output make up half of the course, and your focus is only on reading, then then meaning focused input you forget about meaning focused output. Meaning focused input then should make up half of your course time, and then another quarter is reading fluency development. And then a quarter of that, then another quarter is language focused learning. And, and as you say, maybe a third or a quarter of that should be intensive reading. So if it was a third, then you're absolutely correct. You know, one twelfth of your course time should be on uh, intensive reading. Yeah, that's, 
that's uh it's interesting because you know most of the time it's in most classes it's 90 percent <laughs> so yeah. so that's, yeah, that's, that's right. a very different uh you know approach yeah that's right and and by doing that then you're not developing fluency you're not developing the normal reading skills that you would want to develop you know right. and so uh, you know it's important to make sure that that uh, you, you're reaching the goal that you want and that goal as I mentioned right at the beginning is being able to read a text and deal with the message of the text you know use language in a communicative way and reading is a, is a communicative activity it, the text is communicating to the reader for sure yeah so so I want to um, just ask a couple of more questions here so what one is about the teachers in the classroom so um one of the things you say in your book um, that I thought was really interesting is um, teachers teach too much. And, yeah. you know, this is something that, you know, some teachers might be <laughs> feel, you know, a little bit offended by, you know, why, why um, you know, why, why would teaching too much be a harm to to the students? You know, so so what do you mean by this? And and what should the primary role of, of the teacher be in a language classroom? I mean, I'm, I'm especially thinking here, you know, again, of of this the intensive reading, right? Like, th because that's their primary, that's what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're in front of the class. They're showing, you know, what the morphology is or, um, you know, certain uh, forms of the language. So so why, why could that be um, not the best way to go about um, learning? Well, from the point of view of the four, uh, from the point of view of the four strands, I take a I use a very limited definition of teaching and the definition of teaching means getting up the, with the focus on the teacher and the teacher leading the the class through the lesson. Now meaning focused input shouldn't involve teaching. Meaning focused input should involve the learners reading with the text. In an extensive reading program the teacher should either be quietly reading the teacher's own book you know a, a book setting an example for the learners or getting on and marking marking homework or you know whatever things like that and let the learners get on with the reading and the same would be with extensive listening and and meaning focused output shouldn't really be teacher focused activity it should be learners either delivering a talk for others to listen to or communicating with other people and so on and fluency development doesn't involve teaching in the sense of the teacher laying down the law it involves doing extensive reading passage uh, sorry fluency development uh, reading which is no unknown words or anything like that and and reading really easy material and so on so the, the role of the teacher then is to teach is in the language focused learning strand and so that and, and it's when teachers start taking over all the activities and at the center of the tension or most of them you're actually then losing meaning focused input and meaning focused output and fluency development the number one role of the teacher is to plan. That's the number one job. And there are two major things from a vocab perspective with planning. And, and the first one is make sure that the learners are focusing on the vocabulary which is most useful for them. And the second thing about planning is make sure that the learners have opportunities for learning across the four strands. So that there's, you know, there's an extensive reading program and that there's opportunities for fluency development and so on like that. The second, um, uh, the second uh, role of the, the teacher is to organize. And that is make sure that the learners know what to do with extensive reading. Make sure that the learners uh, have the opportunity to do um, you know, fluency, g just getting the class working well, not the teacher teaching the language, but getting the learners doing the kinds of things they need to be doing as well. In New Zealand, we have schools, there are not so many of them now, but they were country schools where a teacher would teach up to 12 students aged from 5 to 12. And, and that teacher then would have to have beginners just arrived at school, you know, for a few days a week, teaching them how to read. And you'd have people at age 12 who are doing, you know, d sort of advanced reading for primary school and mathematics. And the te those teachers were brilliant. They could organize a little classroom and some things were done in groups and some things, you know, and the groups would change and 
older learners would be teaching younger learners and it was all beautifully organized. I mean, I'd, I would have loved my child to go to a, a country school because there was such, you know, interaction and variety of experience. But these teachers were brilliant at organizing this work. And so that's the second job of the teacher. The third job, so we've got planning as the number one, organizing as number two, and I'm going to forget what they are, but never mind, we always do that, I always forget the last one. And then, then maybe the, the, um, the, the third job of the teacher might be to test, and that is to see where the learners are in their progress, um, test them to give them a bit of motivation to carry on learning and something like that. Oh, sorry, the third one is train. I knew I'd muck it up. <laughs> the, th the third job of the teacher is to train, and that is train them in strategies so that they can take care of their own learning, so that if the teacher wasn't there, and the teacher really shouldn't be there from a lot of it, they know what to do. If they've got new words to learn, they know what to do. They know about repetition. They know about thoughtful processing. They know about spacing the repetitions. You know, they know time on task. If you want to be good at reading, then do lots of reading. If you want to get good at listening, do lots of listening and things like that. And they know the importance of developing autonomy and taking control of their own learning. And they know how to do it, you know. And so that's training. And then the teacher should test to see that, learners and, and then the last job of the teacher is to teach and that is carry out extensive reading be able to explain unknown words and so on be able to do a bit of grammar work and things like that teaching is not particularly efficient if you measure the effect of teaching immediately after the piece of teaching you're lucky to get a score of about 50 percent from the learners simply because there hasn't been enough repetition and so on so, te but teaching's important. There are good things that teachers can do, and so on. But the other things of planning, organizing, training—I'm doing well. Testing yeah, <laughs> and teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough repetitions. That's probably the reason. <laughs> um, you know, th these are the other jobs which are really important for getting language learning going. Yeah, it's uh, it, it makes me think. Um, you know that that a lot of classrooms are actually set up to teach and not to learn you know yeah. where where it it cuz it feels like you know the if the goal is learning you know you can obviously see the benefits of um you know this methodology training training someone how to learn is far more effective you know than than just teaching them right because mm -hmm. they'll take that with them the rest of their lives but but I, I think we've missed a lot of times the goal of of learning, you know, the students learning rather than just, you know, just teaching, right? And we've made yeah, well, that the goal. that's right. I ways. mean, you can have teachers who teach really well and not a lot of learning takes place as a result of it, you know. And, and um, the principles of learning I've outlined in that free book, you know, what should every EFL... Oh, sorry. What do you need to know to learn a foreign language? You know, because I think it's really important that learners know what to do and how to do it. And it, it's it's not magic and it's not secret. It's something you can quite easily learn to do. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to end um, with this this final question. Um, so we've talked a lot about you know kinds of the unique um, situation we're in, like learning. A dead language you know one that's only written um and we've talked some about you know how to improve upon you know reading that text um so you you obviously you know we've talked about this you're a big fan of extensive reading um that involves the creation of of new texts right um hmm. what what do you think would be if someone were to say okay i i want to implement this in my classroom um you know what would be the the you know, something that they could do that would kind of give them sort of like instant results. You know, I, I could implement this and I know that um, there's going to be, you know, more um, learning going in, going or taking place that is useful for my students in, in the long run. Yeah, th that that's a harder question for me than it should be. and And the reason why it's harder is because of your unusual yeah your unusual situation my normal answer to that question would be the most important thing you can do in a language classroom would be to set up a good extensive reading program 
because th that's an enormous lack and yet all the all the materials needed are there they're also available electronically for paying a small amount a month you know teachers can have unlimited access to a very wide range of graded readers and so on but in your your program you don't have graded readers so i'd have to then probably say that my number one priority would be training learners in how to learn train learners in language focus uh, in in strategies for managing their own learning for developing learner autonomy i also think that your learners should know about ZIPF's law, that's Z-I-P-F, and you can, f if you Google it, I think you'll find uh, plenty of information about it. But this, the, the basic information in ZIPF's law, which is important, is that a small number of words occur very frequently. About half of the words in a text occur only once. And so you then then have to make a sensible decision about what are you going to do about those words that occur only once. Are you going to say, look, we'll concentrate on learning the high frequency words because they're going to pay off no matter what you, you know, what, whatever you continue to read in this. And that will then find some way of glossing the, the words which occur only once. Or if you've got to memorize them, then get, you know, learn how to memorize and do sensible memorize. There are good principles for that. It's a very well researched area indeed. And, and there are principles which, which make that learning very effective. So I would, I would put number one as learner training. Yeah, that's, but it sounds like what we, what we really need is um, better graded readers <laughs> um, for, for more extensive reading or, or more texts. Um, you know, there are graded readers, right? But, but you, you just wouldn't normally reach that 98% level. And we have a graded reader built into our, you know, into our software. Basically, you can just... Um, you know, categorize each chapter of the text um, by how many words you know, right? And it's keeping track yeah. of all the words you know. Yeah. yeah. But but unless you're getting to higher levels, it's not as helpful for for that extensive reading. Um, yeah. One one of the principles I pointed out in that book, you know, what do you need to know, know to learn a foreign language? One of the principles is work hard. Mm. Um, <laughs> learning a language is not easy. There's a lot to learn. You know, in English, you probably need to know somewhere between 5,000 and 9,000 words just to get close to 98% coverage. You know, it's quite a lot of words to learn. And uh, you're not going to do that through magic. You've just got to keep going at it and keep yourself motivated and, you know, try and use a balance of learning opportunities. But, but you know, it's hard work. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's, but it's I, easily possible, right? <laughs> well, I think that's a great place to to end. You know, it's 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 possible, but but hard. Uh, <laughs> you know, so have realistic expectations. You know, but uh, but but I think th the goal really is attainable. So, so that's all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages podcast. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. Thanks. You're very welcome, and good luck. Thanks, and thank you to all of our listeners out there who have taken the time to listen to the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. We hope you enjoyed the episode.